Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here on this wonderful spring day, uh, which we will open up the curtains later so that you can see a little bit of the Hudson River and the sunshine. But in the meantime, I welcome you and thank you so much for being here um, on this wonderful day. Before we get started, I would like to thank Remy. Where are you, Remy? There you are, Remy Bahati. I don't know if I pronounced your last name correctly from the Office for the Advancement of Research, who really did a stand-up job organizing this and advertising um, this wonderful event. Um, and I'd also, from OAR office, like to thank Dan Stageman and everybody else with whom you work at that um, office, as well as to the Department of Anthropology and our chair, Ed Snyder, and all the faculty um, for co-sponsoring this event, along with the Anthropology Student Club. Yay, Anthropology <laughs> Student Club. So now let me introduce our speaker today, Suvi Rautio. Did I pronounce your last Rautio? It's easier for me to say Ra Rautio. So Dr. Rautio comes to us at John Jay as a visiting scholar from the University of Helsinki in Finland, uh, where she received a doctorate in social and cultural anthropology in 2019 and where she is currently a postdoc fellow. Uh, Professor Rautio's research is primarily centered on minority villages in southwest China, where she examines processes of urbanization and transnationalism. She also studies issues related to cultural heritage and how these are played out in local communities and across countries and continents. These interests have led to multiple publications um, on ways rural development and the growth of tourism are tied to the politics, aesthetics, and bureaucratization of heritage sites, a very important issue these days, and on how shifting geopolitical structures have direct consequences for young people's mobility ac across Africa and China and on ways ideologies of masculinity figure into coping strategies of rural to urban male migrant workers returning to their home Chinese villages as opportunities in cities decline. She publishes in both English language and Chinese language journals. For over two years, uh, she has served as host of the widely acclaimed New Book Network podcast channel that receives about a million visitors a month. And if you have never checked it out, please check out the New Book Network. So today, in a, ta a talk titled Love Letters, Professor Rautio gives us a taste of her current research, a project that she's been working on in Finland and in New York. So without further ado, please help me welcome Dr. Suvi Rautio. Thank you so much, Professor Waterston. Can, you, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, thank you so much. It's really an honor to be um, in New York in CUNY at John Jay. It's also an honor to be standing up here and talking about my research today. Thank you so much for everyone who's come here and um, for everyone who's made this possible. Um, so I'm just gonna start, dive right, in, right into it. So the title of my talk, The Love Letter, is Dreams at the Dawn of the Mao Zedong Era. On 23rd March, 1953, Automy wrote a letter from Helsinki to her, fi her fiancé in Paris, who she refers to as Chur, informing him of the public announcement of their marriage bans at the church the day before. Automy and Chur had only just met four months ago in Paris during Automy's brief, brief visit traveling to the city to see friends. When she returns to Helsinki, Chur and Automy stay, stay in touch by sending each other love letters and soon they decide to get married. In their haste to hold the wedding ceremony, Chur was unable to prepare the paperwork necessary to cross borders from France to Finland. This obstacle did not stop them from moving forward with arranging the bans, which after all did not require both members to be present. To compensate for his absence, Armi places a framed photograph of Chur on display at a reception held at her home after the church. Because Chur had never been to Finland, he had never met her relatives, many of whom had probably no idea who she was marrying. 
In the letter, Armi mentions the sensation that was aroused when her guests learned that Chur is a Chinese man. She describes how her relatives lean in to inspect the photograph of Chur, this mysterious absent groom. She writes, but he is quite a handsome boy, they proclaim. He could just as well be somebody from east of Finland. And to please me, they say they, there's, something about my, there's something Chinese about my looks too. Autumn's soft curls and round-shaped blue eyes would hardly fit the physical attributes more commonly associated with someone of Chinese descent. But to account for where these ideas on race and racial stereotyping might derive from, Armi writes, well, I must explain to you that an ordinary Finn thinks that all Chinese people still wear braids in the middle of their head. And that my friends and relatives were surprised that to see you look almost, well, like a European. The correspondences in the letters I present today document the growing bond between Armi Rautio, my grandmother, and Lin Zongji, my grandfather, both of whom are, whom are no longer alive. Oh, wait. Um, and now the next one. Yeah. <laughs> Today the letters are stored in the basement of my parents' home in Helsinki, placed in the upper right-hand drawer of a small cabinet attached to a much larger bookshelf. Filled to the brim, the drawer, the drawer is heavy, and if you manage to open it, the letters will spill over the sides, and you might not be able to close it again. I start this talk with the backstory of these love letters, which are a piece of a puzzle of my bigger research project. Combining history, anthropology, and politics, my project begins with my grandparents and their two sons, my uncle and father, who formed a mixed ethnicity Finnish Chinese family. At the heart of my research is to study the backstory of a political moment when an imagined socialist future generated a sense of euphoria and the repercussions that followed when this future was no longer graspable. In this presentation, I focus on love letters in three parts. The first part, yours forever, are letters sent from Armi in Finland to Chur in France in 1953 when the couple, um, when the couple first met. I then move to Country of Miracles, which are letters mailed from Chur to Armi in 1955 when Chur moves to Finland from, moves to Finland, from Finland to China and waits for Armi to follow him there. I conclude with Red Roots, where I jump to the year 1966 in China, and moving away from the love letters, I turn to analysis with interviews, from interviews with my father. Throughout the presentation, the narrative I convey are a part of intimate ethnography, a term coined by Elise Waterston and Barbara Wilco Bauer that refers to the methodology of describing and analyzing the rich and complex life histories of family members in order to find a way to link their stories to larger social processes. Yours forever. The first set of letters that I analyze were written in 1953, written from Automy to Chur during the cold, bitter winter months in Helsinki. When she's not writing in haste, she responds to Chur's letters in the evening, sipping coffee with the calming tunes of the radio playing in the background. Typed but some handwritten on thin, almost transparent paper, Automy's letters to Chur were sent at least twice a week, sometimes every day. In their first months of correspondence, she closes her letters with yours forever. A few weeks later, when she learns that she is pregnant, she begins to sign off with your fiancé, always followed by her handwritten signature, Armi. The letters start on, on the day that Armi returns to Helsinki after her travels in Paris and when she met Chur. After a very brief encounter, their physical separation is replaced by their epistolary correspondence. In her first letter, she captures the poetry of the landscape traveling back to Finland, which speaks to a sense of hope of the moment. The sky was dark blue with a bright moon. How could one sleep with such a magnificent view before one's eyes? The sun began to rise in a fire red line far in the horizon, and the earth below was thinning, lilac colored between the scattered clouds. Gradually, the gold, golden power of the sun filled the whole world around us. Over the months, the letters keep the couple connected in times of separation. The letters speak to the sense of curiosity and eagerness to explore the world. They were both committed to their studies. Automy was nearing the end of her degree program in English philology at the University of Helsinki, and Schur had received a scholarship from Beijing to study psychology at the Paris Sorbonne University. 
In the letters, they share the reflections and contemplations on topics that they're both reading about and studying. They also describe daily happenings, offer words of guidance, and dispute points that the other has made. Issues of trust, jealousy, and future expectations are dotted, dotted across the letters, appearing and reappearing over the months of daily exchange. The letters are also full of lists. Their acquired habit of list making speaks to their effort of organizing the world around fixed points, something that they continue to perfect through to their old age. Lists of uh, elaborate health advice. Automy writes, don't miss any meals, take an hour's walk every day, rub your entire body with a rough, rough towel of cold water starting from your limbs, followed by an entire page detailing where and how to place the cold, water, uh, cold towels on one's body. They provide lists of bureaucratic obstacles that, they were, that were keeping them apart, and more lists advising one another on how to overcome these obstacles with the Chinese legation and Finnish foreign ministry. Surprisingly, they rarely dwell on the more common subjects that one would expect when getting to know one another. The letters are personal, but they contain few introductory paragraphs detailing their past experiences or family backgrounds. Regardless of this deep familiarity, that that the two seem to share from the onset of their relationship, Chir and Automy came from vastly different geographical, political, and cultural backgrounds. Automy's place of birth, Borvo, is a small port town along Finland's southern coastline, neighboring Russia's border. Her parents had already passed away, and with no siblings, Automy did not feel bound to her birth town, that she, but she carried a sentimental attachment to it for her entire life. Chur was born in the bustling frontier of Fujian province in southwest China into a wealthy maritime trader family. Youngest of four children and the only son, he was the pride of his family. As you can see, he's the baby his father is carrying. By the time that Chur met Automy, his kin had migrated away from mainland China. Their migration responded with the lives of many Chinese citizens who in the 1940s made their exodus across the Taiwan Strait to relocate their lives in the Nationalist Party administered island of Taiwan. Both Automy and Chu came from merchant families that valued educational merit and achievement. This commonality is also what brings them together in their habit of letter writing, which after all speaks to a writer's level of education and class background. They both considered themselves cosmopolitan individuals who savored elegance and intellectual craft. Chur sa savored his four years away from China, living in the highbrow pockets of Paris, enjoying the freedom of a bachelor's life. Automy's curiosity and travel brought her to cities across Europe and America, enjoying the freedom of work and adventure. She was ahead of her time, a childless, a childless and single woman in her mid-30s was still a rarity in the early 1950s, but rather than expressing the heavy burden that her age and gender must have carried, she tells Chu, 35 is no impossible age. At least I don't feel old myself. There is still so much I want to do, and let's believe what the English have discovered. Life begins at the age of 40. In addition to the communicative outlet of letters, writing love letters in particular is a learned social practice that speaks to the rise of conjugal bonds and individualism, as anthropologist Laura Ahern also has noted, studying love letter writing in Nepal. This is apparent in the language that Chu and Automy use, which draws on rich sentimental expressions to resonate with their own conceptions of romance and personhood. I'm not a scientist, I don't speak with my brains, but with my heart, Automy writes, and the question of our love is not race or economic problems or sexual love. It is about whether we can understand and appreciate each other and whether we are able to speak the same language of heart. And if, if we don't understand each other, in the beginning, we must be able to show that we can give the other an opportunity for mental liberty and give up our own ideas if we feel we are wronged. The, con the content of the letters also reminds us that love does not only consist of the kind of romantic love found between individuals, but has the power to extend across larger groups to carry political and, politi and collective change. Love becomes an embodied form that describes a person's world vision and philosophical ponderings as a statement of how they position themselves in society. Oh, sorry. That was the... One more. Yeah. 
This comes through in Automy's discussions around women through a feminist persona in ways that produce forms of seeing and being in the world. Her reflections on gender inequalities reflect a more general concern in women's subordination to men. She writes, men are like butterflies flying from one flower to the next without any shame or responsibility. What might become of this world if women weren't realistic because the men have no sense of reality? They live only for their ideals. Well, maybe we women wouldn't endure it either if romanticism would die away. Women are left to carry that shame and responsibility. Very, very few men in this world are as human as you, my dear Chu. Of all the topics they ponder and discuss in their letters, their immediate future plans together remain unresolved. Regardless of the pleasures they committed as a to get committed to as a married couple, they had not yet decided where and how to build their lives as a family, and bureaucratic paperwork was keeping the couple apart. In their letters, they reflect on both the euphoria of the possibilities and promises that New China offer, including its uncertainties. As the months unfold, the letter correspondences are overtaken by discussions around the challenges of bureaucracy. And Automy is hit by a sense of reality, and her sense of hopefulness towards building a life together in China is replaced with fear towards what the country's future society will bring. At the time, China's transition to communism had only just begun, and counter to Automy, from Chu's point of view, under Chairman Mao Zedong's leadership, his motherland was full of promise and hope. His words express a sense of euphoria of the time, shedding light to the hope of political transformation. In one of the rare preserved letters written by Chu to Automy, he tells her, I'm sorry that you have such prejudice in communism. I hope this problem would not be, your, be our obstacle. Communism is for me a kind of study, a kind of social science. Communism makes me, be, makes me have confidence in love and the better future. I love com communism not for power, neither for situation. It is a play of ideas for me. Love and liberty were not only prominent ideas among Chinese intellectuals abroad, like Chu, but a shared global drive towards co a communist future. Socialism existed as a moral project that transcended national identities towards the co-participation of common aims and virtues. And as the Argentine Marxist revolutionary Che Guevara puts it, the true revolutionary is guided by a great feeling of love. Chu carries this love with him when he eventually moves to China two years down the line. This migration across continents does not happen immediately. Before his return to the motherland, China finally secures his paperwork to move from Paris to Helsinki. Their first son, my father, is soon born, and by the second year in 1955, their second son, my uncle, is born. During the three years as a family in, fin uh, family in Finland, Chur is unable to find work in his line of profession as a psychologist and a scholar. Instead, he seeks manual labor in hotel kitchens, cleaning dishes, and Automy remains the breadwinner of the family, working as a translator and English teacher. As a former colony of Russia, Finland was still a young country and had only been independent for just over 30 years. Finland was, and continues to be, an an ethnically homogenous nation, unprepared to integrate immigrants such as Chu into the workforce. This makes Chu feels like a second class citizen and he eventually convinces Armi that migrating to China will bring him under an academic line, which would also be beneficial for the family. In 1955, Chu returns to China with their second born son, my uncle, who is only 10 months old at the time. The plan was that once Chu secures a job in academia and finds a home, Automy will follow with their firstborn son, my father, who was three years old at the time. This physical separation between Automy and Chu revives their letter writing. Now I move to the second chapter, Country of Miracles. From Finland, to, from Finland, Chu and his son travel the border to Russia and jump on the Rostock train, crossing Siberia's vast plateaus for 15 days before arriving in Beijing. On the fifth day of travel, when they have reached the broad steppes of the Ural Mountains, marking the border between Europe and West Siberian plains, Chu writes to Armi, informing her that they have now safely entered Asia. Like the sense of hope captured in Automy's first letters to Chu, his letters express a poetics of the future, 
and the euphoria of what's to come. He writes, the snow is so beautiful and the sun shines brilliantly. Siberia seems to me so sweet and calm. Mountains are timid too. They lay there quietly like a nice sleeping child. In the months of epistolary correspondence that follows, the preserved letters trace Chur's experiences returning and settling in Beijing to find work as an academic. After seven years of living outside China, his return enlightens his emotions. He writes to Armi, informing her, you don't know how much gratitude I have for my new government and my country. I start to love them immediately, as much as I love you, my mother, my two sons. Now China is a country of miracles. This sense of euphoria becomes an underlying theme in his letters when he first returns. Many Chinese overseas academics were following the same trajectory as Chu, especially those coming from the United States. At the time, Chairman Mao Zedong had been in power for six years, and the Red Terror spreading across American society had seeped, in, seeped into academia, creating hostile, hostile spaces of racial discrimination targeted towards Chinese personnel. Many were eager to break away from this discrimination and make the voyage back to, to the motherland to participate in building new China. The Chinese government induced these returnees with prestigious salaries and status. Three months after Chu's return, the Chinese government secures a job for him as a lecturer in psychology and offers him and his family subsidized accommodation on the university grounds. Now that he has a job, his next task is to convince Armi to join them in China. In his letters, he provides detailed accounts of the free services provided by the Chinese government, including medical and childcare. In the letters, he again returns to the acquired habit of list making, which can also be considered acts of love in efforts to reassure Armi that they have a happy life ahead of them in Beijing. In these lists, he includes detailed accounts of living and food costs, including a variety of the costs of fruit. Pears are 74 cents, grapes are 96 cents, apples 78 cents, bananas 32 cents. Also taking into account, and in these lists, he also takes into account Western del delicacies from coffee, 500 grams cost 12.50, to sausages, 2.40, to cognac, 6.40, and even champagne, only five yuan, 60 cents. Eventually, five months after their separation, Armi moves to Beijing with my father and the family are re reunited again. Thus far, I have traced the migra migratory trajectories of a love story that crisscrosses co countries, continents, and language groups in the 1950s. Moving away from the love letters, the material I turn to now pieces together analysis that draws on interviews with my father in his upbringing in Beijing. I turn to the third chapter, Red Roots, In what I talk about in the remainder of this presentation, I place my father as a central figure, referring to him using his Chinese name, Lin Baixi, which can be translated to White Dawn. I fast forward from 1956 to the year 1966 to consider how the sense of euphoria of the political moment I describe above was shattered. In Chinese contemporary history, 1966 marks the beginning of the decade long the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution. By this point of his career, Mao Zedong had seized power in China for 17 years and was an expert at mobilizing and steering populations towards his ideology through the engineering and management of people's emotions. Loyalty to the party was performed through the explicit differentiation of insider and outsider in very much the same way that Carl Schmitt writes about in reference to the practice of politics as that which is reducible to the existential difference between friend and enemy. As a child, Bai Xi learned that the differentiation between friend and enemy are shaped by the geopolitical categories that people are familiar with. Growing up in China, Bai Xi's blonde hair and green eyes have always made him conspicuous. And people's compelling need and attraction to fit people into categories, us and them, are always defined by their physical attributes. And this continued to chase him throughout his youth. Bai Xi tells me of how these categories were imposed on him. When China was still in good, good diplomatic terms with the Russians, people called me Russian. When these ties deteriorated and China befriended Albania, I was labeled as Albanian. And then when Nixon came to visit China in 1972, I was called Nixon. 
Russia, Albania, and Nixon are just as foreign to Bai Xi as they are to those who called him that, because Bai Xi saw himself as Chinese, and this made him want to take part in Mao's revolutionary efforts in every way he possibly could. When the Cultural Revolution picked up, Bai Xi was only 13 years old. At first, he and hundreds of others followed the revolution unfolding across the country on a small TV the size of a shoebox and a huge hall on the university campus where Chu, his father, worked and where they lived as a family. On the screen, they watched and listened to Mao Zedong's speeches full of promise that tapped deeper into the widespread grievances among peasants and workers as allies. Mao also secured political loyalty in the Red Guards, who made up of mainly secondary school and university students, and who saw themselves as the chairman's sentinels. Every evening, hundreds of people crowded around the screen to watch Mao's image and video footage alongside the gleaming Red Guards. In the mornings, people woke up to the chairman's slogans blasting from the loudspeakers positioned across campus. All factions all factions claimed recognition as the true voice of the chairman, and they were, Bai Xi recounts. At the start of the rev revolution, Bai Xi's esteem for Mao was at its height. Across the country, Mao was worshipped like a devotional figure, something akin to a religious icon. Mao was the great leader, Wei Da Lingxiao, and the red son, Hong Taiyang, but he was also emotionally much closer to ordinary people than any previous Chinese leader had ever been. Mao Zedong's charisma unfurled across the country, and from a young, young boy's eyes, his political campaigns were fun events, even sources of entertainment. And because schools were closed in the first months of the Cultural Revolution, this was like any other teenager's dream. Bai Xi started volunteering at the university bookshop alongside basic textbooks on chemistry and mathematics. At this time, only Mao's and Stalin's books were sold in the bookshop. With rising demands for Mao's red book, long queues would line up at the bookshop with eager buyers to get their hands on a copy. When the shop ran out of, ran out of copies, Bai Xi started printing his own pamphlets, preaching Mao's words. Mao's little red book was a driver for chain, change amongst activists outside of China too. Chairman Mao believed that his methodologies illustrated how the world can undertake revolution, a task that the Black Panther Party bravely adopted in order to challenge the ruling white establishment. Western Europe, Europe ran their own Maoist fevers. The protest cultures of the late 1960s passionately identified with Mao's message. The allure of Maoism has had such a long afterlife and res revolutions and insurrections to transform states into countries such as Vietnam, Cambodia, Zimbabwe, Peru, India, and Nepal. And Nepal is the only country where this is still practiced. Maoism offers opportunities to give voice to the oppressed and to dismantle systems of power through the driving force of revolution. And revolution, as Mao Zedong so famously reminds us, is not a dinner party. Revolution is violence. Revolution is bloodshed. Bloodshed. Revolution carries the aim of overthrowing one class with another. These were trialed and tested across China's universities, where intellectuals and their families were viewed with pathological suspicion and placed under intense scrutiny. The red armbands that Red Guards wore were, were carried with pride, and it gave them license to exercise violence as they were slowly growing into the pseudo-military designation. Mao applauded their combative ways by proclaiming, to rebel is justified, reminding the Red Guards not to hesitate, but to bombard the headquarters. Bai Xi watched the revolution unfold around him. Victimization and redemption were rehearsed on a daily basis to demonize perceived enemies. People's lives were dissected and put on display to be condemned. For Bai Xi, as a young boy, public display of humiliation and torture were events, just like going to the market, he recalls. Mao's orders did not only mean overthrowing the entire educational hierarchy, but pounding through the private realms of intellectuals' homes, ransacking their property, and stripping them of their status. For many, the abuse was taken further to shred them of their humanity. When the torturing became unbearable for intellectuals, many took their lives and jumped from the rooftop of their apartment complex. The thump of a body on the hard concrete surface echoed across the campus 
attracting the attention of crowds who would gather around to witness the shattered corpse on display. These gatherings were sometimes the highlight of the day, Baishi recalls. The acts of political violence were concealed in the pursuit of entertainment for children like Baishi. Entertainment becomes a silencing tactic to survive the chaos and disorientation. 60 years since the Cultural Revolution, Baishi tells me, when you're surrounded by traumatic events, you grow accustomed to forgetting. It becomes a survival tactic. In order to forget, you have to find more entertaining ways to silence the suffering and protect oneself. This echoes anthropologist Michael Tausig's work, who reminds us that silencing and seeing no evil is often a response to fear. Having grown up in an intimate living environment like university campus, the victims of torment were never merely strangers. They were Baishi's neighbors, his teachers, his headmasters, and even the, par uh, the parents of his closest friends. Eventually, the circle started getting smaller, and the corporeal signs of social destruction under the name of revolution started to creep in closer. Little did Baishi know that at the time, watching the persecution of his neighbors only meant that his father was next. His familiar experience of seclusion and being cast out from the collective was soon made a target for political violence. Terror, by Xi informs me, is not merely recognizing that ideological delirium turns ordinary people into monsters who will eventually devour the, devour the weak, but instead terror is about waiting until the monster catches you. Terror, he tells me, is knowing that soon it's your turn. In one of our interviews, Bai Xi recalls the day when he, recall, when he realized it was he, he who could no longer escape. It was in the summer when a big truck of red guards drove to the entrance of his four-story apartment complex. Excitedly, Bai Xi and his friends hurriedly followed the red guards, eager to see whose home they were going to confiscate this time. Soon the red guards left again, and Bai Xi and his friends figured that they'd just come to the wrong address but it did not take long until they returned, and this time they went up to the third floor and came to Bai Xi's home. He was in complete shock. The Red Guards confiscated books, forks, knives, and even took Mao's red books and all of the family's collection of Mao's symbols. They stole all of it. Chu was not at home when the Red Guards came, but he did, he did not return home in the evening either. When they finally notified the family of the prison Chu had been taken to, Bai Xi went to bring clean clothes for him. When he arrived, the prison personnel returned the clothes Chu had been wearing when he was captured, and they were covered in dry blood. Later, he turned, uh, later he, Chu tried to escape the prison, but it did not take long until the Red Guard sent him back again and beat him up so his lips, uh, ribs broke. He must have been beaten up on a daily basis, Bai Xi recalls. The day his father was first imprisoned was 13-year-old Bai Xi's first taste of Mao's brutality. His fighting spirit towards the revolution died, and like a slap on the face, he saw what was unraveling around him with his own eyes, with new eyes. He saw how the political regime was defined by how red an individual's roots are, and how this redness was assessed by their bloodline. The red roots of my family were not the kind of roots that grow down. The roots were too shallow to penetrate into the soil. The roots belonged to the family of traitors. Their loyalty and zeal towards the party was entirely unwanted. Soon after Chu was arrested, the Red Guards targeted Bai Xi and they took him to a re-education camp for 81 days. When he was released, he was frequently hunted down, recaptured, and publicly ridiculed for the remainder of his teenage years. Mao's slogans that he devotedly revered at the beginning of the revolution started sounding like wailing sirens, devouring at his inner core. Chu, my grandfather, Bai Xi's father, Adami's husband, spent two years in prison and two years in the countryside during the Down to the Countryside movement as part of Mao Zedong's efforts to re-educate the Chinese population. Confined away from home life for more than four years, Chu didn't return home until 1972. Otomi, my grandmother, Bai Xi's mother, Chu's wife, was marked a Russian spy for her non-Chinese um, for her non-Chinese attributes and was kept in and out of house arrest throughout the years that Chu was captivated. In 1974, when Bai Xi was finally able to escape China, he chose to place the past behind him. 
These recollections had, have never been given voice to before he recounted them to me in our interviews. Like the letters stored in the basement, his recollections remain as ghosts of the long dead that linger on, that hold on to secrets that get carried from one generation to the next. The stories of love and euphoria that come through in my grandparents' letters that I started this presentation with were followed by serial patterns of violence, dislocation, racism, and structural inequality that narrates Bai Xi's youth, that narrates Bai Xi's youth, but it also narrates a much wider Chinese story. In this story, terror replaces love to become a wider chronic condition that gets penetrated in the social memory of a collective. Slowly, as anthropologists working on pain and terror have shown us, with the routinization of terror leads to the socialization of terror. Just over 40 years have passed since the death of Mao, and China has seen radical changes in society and governing rule. To this day, Maoism can be considered as one of the most significant and complicated forces of contemporary history. And yet, many of the stories of those who experienced this time era remain silenced. Their pasts are disremembered and pushed aside to be replaced by a singular version of history. The story that I've shared with you today is not only one of my family or of China, but is also a warning to citizens everywhere. It is more crucial than ever to deep, delve deeper into the gulf between the facts of history and the stories we tell ourselves to survive in order to recognize the signals of an overturning of politics. If we stick too close to creating boundaries, boundaries between who is friend and who is enemy, we forget that in turning to those categories, we are giving even more power to those who have defined them. Thank you. So oh, I'm really blown away. That was so beautiful. It was moving. It was, it br you brought me into the story and you pointed out the larger implications and each and every one of us have stories. You know, everybody has these stories that have these larger histories and larger implications. We just have to uncover them and not let them be silenced by politics. Anyway, I will stop. Yeah, yeah, okay. So now it's Q&A and comments, and um, so um, uh, I'm going to give the microphone back to you, Suvi. I just had to give her a big hug. It was wonderful. Thank Should you. We No, thank you, Alexis. Um, I know it's it's. I'm still working on the kind of chronicle uh, how to how to kind of put together the the story. So I'm sure you didn't miss anything. This is still something I'm working with, just kind of piece it together. So uh, the love letters that I begin with, that's the the first few months of when they were when they weren't able. They were waiting for the paperwork to 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 get together, and they were able to, so at the time you could be officially get married with the church through the bands, and it was something that's been put together during war times so that couples can get married even if they're separated. Um, so they were able to secure the bands, and then they could hold a kind of real life wedding when they finally got the paperwork to be together. Um, so they only spent a few years in Finland, and then the whole family traveled to Finland, uh, sorry, to China, and um, my grandmother was the only member of the family who remained a Finnish citizen. Um, so she could travel, come and go. But at the time, it was impossible to leave China. And um, my grandmother continued doing that um, until the late 90s. And my grandparents um, spent their final years in, in, in Finland. Um, my grandfather still traveled to China a few times. But they, they remained a couple and um, so together. <laughs> Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that I think that's such a good point, and I think like Elise was saying, everyone has has you no know, family histories, and it's exactly when we put them into perspectives, like the larger history with a capital H, when we align that with our own family history, it's it, it's much closer, and and um, I think it's really important to remember that that um, history is is much closer than we might often imagine. Thank you, I'm gonna use the mic, but <laughs> um, thank you very much, Sui. This was really, really interesting. And I, my question is, um, I just wanted to background this because COVID came and I, I run a senior seminar where students are supposed to do field research. And then when you're not allowed to do it or you, know, you have to Zoom or whatever, one of the things that a lot of students found was a resource in their families. So this is an interesting kind of um, connection to what I wanted to ask about the work here. Um, I'm curious about the extended family and if you have been working, what happened to Cheers extended maritime, you know, merchant family, because there were a lot of people in that, in that <laughs> photograph, right? So I just, if you could talk a little bit more about, do you have plans to try to connect that or was there anything in interviews uh, with your father and, and maybe in the letters. There are beautiful landscapes mentioned in the letters, but I'm a little curious about stories about people, um, if, if you came across them. Yeah, thank you so much, Ed. Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. This is a project I've been wanting to do for a long time, and it was um, through Paul Stoller, who recommended at least, at least Waterston's work, that I even learned that this is something that can be done through ethnography. Um, so really, Professor Waterston has been a massive inspiration and, and, and kind of encouraged me to move forward with this. And I encourage anybody else in the room to, to do similar endeavors. It doesn't need to be something you publish, but it's just... Um, it's, I think it's a, if if we want to if we want to understand how how larger social processes work, and if we want to understand possibility for change, we do need to understand where we come from and our position in society. Um, so I, I do think I, I think it's great that 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 your students were were doing that during during the pandemic. But this was also a very I mean the project was supposed to begin. Uh, with, following the or more interviews with um, the generation that grew up with my father. So this intellectual class in Beijing, I was hoping to return to Beijing in 2020 and, and basically start my ethnography with them. So it was also because of the pandemic that I did turn to the, the those letters in the basement, um, which probably w wouldn't have happened otherwise. Um, as for your question about the larger family, um, yeah, I think that's a, that's also that's a great question, and it's something that um, I've written about in previous versions of this paper. And I guess it, I did focus more on the landscapes here rather than the people, um, just to kind of work with time. And I was trying to trace the migra migratory patterns here. Uh, but but um, I'm guessing you were talking about my the Chinese side of the family. Yeah. So actually, so this is also an example of history being silenced because my father and uncle know very little about about my grandfather's life before. Uh, before, you know, they moved to China, and um, because it's very important to silence those stories, because they were he did come from a landlord family, which of course uh, would have been, um, you know, that would have been something easily to punish um, with during the Maoist era. Uh, but also, I think it's they basically lost all their money. So. Um, that he came from a rich merchant family. And well, the story goes, I was in Taiwan in, in October, so I was spending a bit of time with my aunt, great aunt there. And her story is that um, they had, she had an uncle who was an opium, um, who was addicted to opium, and he spent the family's wealth. So Fujian in Southeast China is an important trade point, and a lot of these drugs were coming in, in and out from Fujian. So it's, it's not so, so much, it's not such an unusual story. Um, but apparently, I mean, it's a tragic one nonetheless. So when they migrated to Taiwan, they didn't have any more of the family wealth. Um, but also why the, si the story would have been silenced is that my grandfather worked for the Nationalist Party. Uh, he was a psychologist. And at the time, um, it was trending everywhere to do military psychology testing. Um, so uh, they were... They were bringing in psychologists from, from Harvard, from Stanford, these massive names who'd worked with World War II soldiers, um, and they were kind of incorporating them with the nationalist um, 
army in the south and southwest region of China, and my grandfather was working alongside these psychologists. So um, all the more reason to silence that because um, you, yeah, the Nationalist Party was the enemy of the communists. So um, so these silent these stories were silenced at home, more silenced at home, but they were also probably silenced from from my grandfather's wider wider narrative in general. Um, so it's only through working with my great aunt that I've been able to to follow follow up on the Taiwanese side. And also in more recent years, there's been more attempts to kind of bring in the psychology association in China. And they've been holding more conferences and so forth. And they've been trying to reach out. Um, so this this generation of my, of my father's cohort, uh, children of psychologists are, have started to kind of reach out and network. So they have also, they have stories of, of my grandfather that my father didn't know of. And, um, and also tragic stories of their own. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure in China so much, but actually, um, there and there's, there's there's there are some researchers who work work on kind of the history of psychology in China. So it probably wouldn't be impossible to, because like I mentioned, they did work with a lot of Americans in the 1940s. So this was this material was brought back to 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 America from China. Um, yeah, but uh, I haven't looked into the actual like archives within mainland China. Adeline. Thank you, and and you guys really are also an inspiration for me because it's really moving to see so many of my students talk about your family history because it's it's it is very different from my understanding of of you know, where, where my parents, where my family's moved about. So it's really also inspirational to hear you guys so often talk about it in class. <laughs> uh, can you hear me? Yeah. I'm, so, I'm sorry, just like, I'm a little bit nervous about here. So um, first of all, I want to say um, I love your story. Like, after all I'm hearing about it, so I have a question. How does it, it inspire you after reading those um, letters? How does it inspire me? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good. That's a really good question and quite personal because um, it's it's really difficult because the 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 people in the letters are not familiar to me. Um, my grandmother, um, they they were my grandmother was a very different person. Um, when I was born from who she is in those letters. Very youthful, very full of hope. Um, it was very much replaced with deep anxiety, depression, something I don't talk about in this paper, but I do talk about in my research. So that, that box in the basement is also full of lots of very dark um, moments in history. Um, so it's really difficult to, it's, it's been a challenge to take the letters as they are, to get to know the people in the letters, to 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 realize you know to learn of their youth um, and also it requires me to be more hopeful in love which <laughs> hasn't always it hasn't always been easy um, this is this is a bit cheesy but actually being in New York has helped because I this city gives me a feeling of love um, I don't know if every other people experience but during the pandemic it was just you know everything was so stagnant and um, it's really you know being in a new environment around so much more, ex you know, different energy. It's, it's, it's made me realize, you know, love can be felt in so many different ways. Um, so that's, that's inspired me to recognize that, um, that there, is, there is love and that these stories are about love and to take them as they are rather than maybe, maybe some of the darker, darker sides that um, kind of my memory is, is, kind of fogs my memory of, of my grandparents or my grandmother in particular. That was a great question, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so first of all, amazing presentation, I just have to say that. And um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you mentioned in your presentation that your grandfather's little red book was used to inspire other revolutionaries like the Black Panther Party and their ideologies. So I thought that was really intriguing because as we all know through, throughout history, you know, especially across our, 
all fronts for black indigenous people of color. Anytime they decide to take a stance against injustice, they are oftentimes targeted. And for myself especially, I'm also doing a similar research study in my law and research course. So I wanted to know, how was the process for you in conducting this research study? Was it strenuous at all? And how were you so patient to gather all this information for this presentation? Oh, thank you. That's a really that's a really sweet question. Um, first of all, the, I just wanted to clarify. So the red book, this is Mao Zedong's kind of collection of of, of quota quotations that's kind of used as a Bible, you know, throughout the anyone who wants to follow Maoist words. And and in in particular, when it's been taken outside of the Chinese context, um, it is a very powerful source of of fighting for change, which is why it was so important amongst Black Panther movement to fight fight against white oppression. And it, I mean, that whole side of history is really fascinating and it's something, not something I dealt with in the paper and not something I'm that familiar with, but the whole coalition between um, Mao and, and the Black Panthers at the time is, is fascinating and really um, opens our eyes to the possibilities that could have, could have been made, um, but because of restrictions from many angles and, and power coming into play, um, kind of construing something that maybe could have could have done a different type of change than, than, than what it led to. Not the destructive, not the violent form of change that maybe people are more familiar with. Um, the patients, that's good, <laughs> um, that's good to hear because I don't, I don't feel I'm that patient with it. Um, so do you mean like working with the letters or? Yes, yeah. to gather all the letters. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've transcri I transcribed everything. I guess I kind of have this, I just have this method that I, I, I count the number of, so there's, there's I probably haven't even touched, you know, I haven't trans, I've transcribed maybe 5% of all the letters in there. Um, so I give myself tasks where I'll choose a certain time period and then I'll count how many pages there are and then divide according to, you know, how many, how many I need to transcribe per day. So it's actually really tedious and it's, and it feels like um, a quite offensive way of looking at them because I don't feel like I'm, again, reading them or, or giving the risk, you know, giving the voice that's necessary for them. I'm just transcribing. Um, and also something that I wouldn't want to pass on to others because it's still it is also quite personal. Um, uh, but then, then what feels much I think where I've lost my patience more is my my um, my work with my father and my uncle. So they really test my patience. <laughs> and um, and uh, yeah, and that's surprising because you know as a, as a researcher as an ethnographer, you know my previous work was all about contact and participating in other people's lives and, and being present, um, you know, verbally, physically, in every way possible. So you'd think that the interviews would be easier. Um, but it, because, it's, because it's so personal um, and it's so much about me as well, so that's where I often lose my patience and I try to take, you know, take breaks when necessary. If something's really upsetting me in an interview, I, I don't reschedule another one until maybe a month after, until I've processed it. Writing field notes is really important. I don't know if that's what you're doing as you're working on your research project, but really writing out, you know, like a, like a diary, trying to write out the emotions. That's fantastic here, by the way, that you're using this opportunity as a research project. Um, but writing it out also helps to make sense of it. Um, it's something that Elise also was just talking about because it is a way of understanding these family members is also a way of understanding not just the larger political social processes but a way of understanding of who we are and how how the people who are closest to us um, have have been put into situations where they kind of are who they are and 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 do pass them on to to the next generation thank you so much yeah. amazing work thank by the you way. Orly In terms of follow-up question to that one, so that's why I kind of intervened in case I know other people have questions. But um, can you talk, you talked a lot about silences, and now you talked about patience or lack of patience. Can you talk about the silences in, that, have, that you're aware of and your conversations with your father and your uncle, um, if any, you know, and, and how you try to work around what might be resistance on their part, in part because you're 
you're entering this very personal territory, but also because you're the daughter yeah. or the niece, and maybe they want to don't want to necessarily say certain things. That was my experience yes. too. Yeah. If you yeah. could talk about that. I mean, my well, first I start with my father. He's he does he's not. He doesn't use a lot of words anyway. I mean, so putting him him in a position in a position where he needs to talk about his past, and and when I said that he's left the, when he left the past behind him, I really mean that. So, um, so it's and he's he's really trying to please me. I think he knows he's you know he I this is something he needs to do with me. So we have these really strict timelines, 45 minutes, and it's like he he prepares dinner or lunch after. Um, and it also gives him an opportunity to leave the scenario. If he's talking about something difficult, then he'll go to the kitchen and shout from the kitchen. Um, but I think it also gives me, him an opportunity to, because the timer is up, you know, like if there's chicken in the oven, you put the timer 45 minutes and it's like, he, <laughs> then the interview's over. Um, so I really have to kind of respect that time frame. And it's also, it's good for me as well because sometimes it's difficult for me hearing a lot of the stories. Um, but I think he, he I don't, I'm not sure how he does it, but I think he gathers his thoughts. He, there was a phase where we were doing interviews quite regularly in 2015, and he would kind of gather the stories or they would start coming alive in his memory. So he'd kind of somehow, again, like the list, he would list it in his, in his thoughts, and then when I come, bam, it'd be like executed to me. And then he said it, we're not gonna return to it ever again. Um, and um, you know, there's very few descriptions, there's few illustrations, so that's something I really have to work with as well. Um, but it's respecting those, his silence, um, but it's also maybe respecting my own as well. Um, because yeah, I don't always, I don't know where it's suddenly gonna go and maybe I'm not always in the right, right, um, right place to. Whereas my uncle is the complete opposite. He will talk for hours, so there's less silences, but that's where my boy lose my patience because it becomes this. Again, my father sticks to the fact. We have to stay to the stick to the facts. Whereas my uncle adds that illustration and that descri description, um, but then I don't always know um, if the yeah maybe there should be a few more silences and pauses and and reflection. So he's kind of he's taken on the persona of of uh, of a victim really because his story really does create a victim of him. He's. Um, He's disabled, he calls himself a third class citizen, he uses terminology um, and uses his narrative, which is a very sad one, um, to, to be the, a victim in society. Um, so he's kind of polished that quite well, yeah. Sorry. Um, hi, um, I really love the whole presentation. Obviously I'm interested in anthropology, and just having that love and personal aspect, um, it was super nice and informative. Um, as an anthropology student, I kind of see professors and um, anthropologists go outside of their culture, studying things that they wouldn't really consider to be the norm. Um, so my question for you is what made you focus to stay within your family and why, um, what made you become so interested in your grandparents? Thank you, that's a really great question. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's debatable, right? Does the anthropologist need to go far away? Um, and, and we can always make something unfamiliar even though it is, is something in your backyard. But I definitely have always known I want to do this project. And the reason is because I was brought up in Beijing. So these, you know, this, this quote from my father when, when you know, being Nixon, being Albanian, um, oh, it's very familiar to me. I've always been the other, I've been, somebody who's 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 non-chinese i'm something but i'm non-chinese um so i've always known i've always wanted to understand more of that and it, i know it starts from from my father's story and i know there thereby then it starts from from the previous generation and so forth so it's something that i've always um wanted to to tackle also because um i think it's so china's so intriguing um, as a superpower, as, as a country as it is, it's so confident in, in, in what China is, and Chinese people are very, very sure of themselves, and um, I find that very startling um, because, well, it's a narrative, right? It's something people have learned. Um, so I've always wanted to kind of disentangle that and, and see where the pauses are and, and, and um, what's underneath that confidence. Why, why, why perform, you know? Um, yeah, which is also why I think it's fascinating being in America, 
<laughs> similar superpowers, similar um, stereotypes bouncing around, confidence. Um, so it's, yeah, I've always been interested in these kind of narratives that people take on and maybe intrigued by it. Um, so, but then to pause and, and to learn what's, what sits behind them. Thanks. No. <laughs> I love the family photos and the archival objects that you show us images of. And uh, I'm also struck by, you know, the, the selection that you have from the beginning of the presentation through to the end. By the way, you know I love the material. Thank you so much for your presentation. I should have said that first. Um, but there is definitely a divide, right, between maybe part one and two and then part three when you go into the Mao era fully. Uh, and your father's story primarily, uh, although not only his. And I'm um, wondering, are you, it seems to me you're dealing with a different set of working materials, his storytelling, for instance, the interviews that you're describing, and maybe with fewer archival objects, such as the letters that document the earlier part of this family history. Um, does that, what kind of influence or effect does that have on your process in dealing with these very different sorts of source materials, I guess. I think that's a great question, and I think it really overlaps with some of the others because it's that that idea of, of patience and, and where I come in, um, that is kind of the, the largest contrast there. But uh, I'll see where the where the project takes me. Um, but yeah, it's 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 interesting writing it out because if they're letters and there's so many of them, then it's that kind of choosing how to illustrate, what to illustrate, is it gonna be people or the landscape and, and what to, what to, there's endless you know words and endless kind of textures and, and stories that come out. Um, and also the letter, the people behind the letters are no longer alive. So it requires more imagination and, and um, the kind of historical imagination there as well. As a, you know, when I'm writing it, the emotions are different, perhaps, because they're um, they're transcribed. They're, they're interviews that I transcribed. So there's voice behind them. I can I can imagine. I can still imagine. You know, my dad sitting on the sofa talking about them, um, rather than somebody at the moment. You know, handwriting out a story. Um, yeah, both both are kind of daunting because I don't want to misrepresent. I don't want to give the wrong story from the letters because, of course, for example, when my grandfather went to China, he's he's trying to impress my grandmother. Come faster, you know. Come take the train and come already. So he's really painting a very romantic picture of China, which I'm not saying he would, isn't accurate, but I do think that there's also there's a lot of um, kind of be beautifying the situation. Um, there, whereas with the interviews, it's I'm the person who's who's the listener. So um, yeah, I don't know. That was a great question. I'll, I'll continue thinking about that. The material that I'm working with. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hello. Yeah. So uh, I have a question that um, the letters you have read so far, from a psychological point of view, uh, what do you think was the greatest suffering from them? Uh, like, was it the loneliness? Was it the long distance marriage? Was it the revolution? Or was it like the identity crisis? What was the greatest suffering for them? Oh, that's a really great question. Um, I think that my, my grandmother was pregnant. Yeah, and she needed security fast. She needed um, her husband. She needed her husband there. She wanted a family. She, that's, that's her main concern in the, in the letters. She's kind of saying, well, I'm, you know, I'm going to be a mother soon. We have a family. You can't just decide we're going to go to China. What if, what if, you know, we don't get security there? So that's her um, biggest kind of fear or, or fear of loss there, um, becoming, you know, just being pregnant. And um, yeah, I guess you know, I mean, just through through you know now. I guess for my grandfather, he he also wanted 
wanted he shared that same fear, but it was also the his his opportunity to secure a job. Um, he wasn't that devoted to academia, and um, I think it's one of those you know examples like all of us experience in life where things kind of fall into place and um, um, but of course he wanted to secure a job, so that would have been in academia. So that was his, his concern. Yeah, but um, yeah, I think it was just the idea of, of being soon, soon, soon to be new family. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much for this, Suvi. I'm sorry I had to come in a little late, so I missed the beginning. But I'm a, I'm a linguist, and I hear you talking about transcribing letters. And um, I was wondering if you could say a little bit about the languages that are at play in your work and how you're dealing with meaning across maybe a couple of different languages. Yeah. Thank you. That's such a great question and something that was also brought to my attention um, when I presented something similar. And it's something I really haven't started analyzing at all so maybe you could help me on this but but it, it's it's true I mean these are letters written in English both by non-native English speakers um, and also kind of a few Finnish words thrown in there to be endearing and sweet um, but but they basically um, I when I transcribed them I I um, tried to make sure out of spell didn't fix my errors. I tried to keep the grammatical inaccuracies there and the misspellings there as well um, but I, I haven't yet figured out how to how to work with um, kind of translation or or how to analyze the translation element here. Um, both both people talking about something very very you know sentimental and close to one's heart in another language, um, or not not just from a little another language but a written text as well. So um, I'm wondering maybe we could we could talk more and you could you could help me on this because I'm not a linguist and this is very new for me. Yeah. such a rich project. It is very complex. Um, you know, having done a similar project, uh, to go back to what Ed um, asked about, you know, you could just keep going and going and going, and then you're going to go and lose your mind. Um, so there is a way to, you have to circumscribe it. And also Jenny's question about the, the source material, and there is this varied source material that some some stuff is available, some stuff is not available, and you just have to figure out how to work with what remains, you know, and, and, and always know that it's partial. But anyway, but it's so fantastic. I know this is going to be a fantastic. Whatever the final product will be is going to be great, and um, I hope it's a book, um, <laughs> but maybe with a, some multimodal aspects to it um, so that we can share, you can share your story with with the world, and thank you, it's fantastic. Thank you, thank you so much for everyone coming.